All right, we've been talking about solids, we've been talking about, or excuse me, we've been talking about gases, we've been talking about liquids, and now we're going to talk about solids. But we're not going to talk about properties that exist within solids as we did with liquids and gases. We're more just going to talk about the different types of solids. Now, don't worry about getting all this knowledge down. I will tell you kind of what's important. And what's important here is the first, the understanding the first five or six slides, and I'll highlight that. Other than that, we're going to take a quick tour through just the different types of solids and the different types of properties that they have. Now, we have not ever discussed this, and it's not much that's going to be on the AP test about this. So, like I said, don't sweat it, but we're just going to talk about kind of the types of materials that exist. So, remember, we just got done talking about in Chapter 9, the atomic orbitals give rise to the molecular orbitals, like a diagram like this. And this these first handful of slides are important. In such compounds, the inner energy gap between the molecular orbitals essentially disappears, and what we have is a continuous band. This continuous band is what gives solids their conductivity. In molecular orbitals, when the band, the energy band, is essentially zero, the conductivity is great, that's a metal. In a semiconductor, the energy band, which is right here, is somewhat far apart, but not far enough to completely eliminate conductivity, so it's a semiconductor. And in insulators, the, the energy band is so far apart that it can't conduct electricity. So the gap determines whether a substance is a metal, semiconductor, or insulator. So that's kind of how metals, semiconductors, and insulators work, or what we call insulators as non metals. So you kind of have an idea there. There's types of materials. Don't have to know that last slide. Not a big deal. So in metals, the valence electrons are partially filled in the band and our energy band is essentially zero. There's no need for the electron to go from lower to higher in the unoccupied part. Semiconductors, again, we are just showing the key thing that I want you to know here is that in semiconductors, or excuse me, the key thing I want you to know is that there's no gap in metals, a small gap in semiconductors, and a gap too large for to be electricity to be conducted in insulators. And that is kind of as we go through. When we talk about semiconductors, a handful of elements that are semiconductors, silicon, germanium, graphite, which is carbon. And that, and that kind of explains that. We're not going to talk about doping. This shows insulators right here. All right, one of the types of solids that you can talk about is ceramics. You guys might have used ceramics uh, in art. They're inorganic solids. They're usually hard and brittle. They are highly resistant to heat, corrosion, and wear. So just an idea of some ceramics, not a big deal here under the rest of them. Superconductors. Superconductors at very low temperatures. Some substances lose all resistance to the flow of electrons. Now, resistance is like electrical friction, right? So imagine like in a wire, when electricity is flowing through it, those electrons are flowing through it, those electrons have some resistance in the wire. Well, there are substances which eliminate that resistance, which would essentially be like for the electron moving down an ice rink. All right, this can be super helpful because resistance creates heat. It slows down electricity. The faster you can have something moving conductor, the more efficient it could be. All right, we're not going to focus a lot on the, the idea of semiconductors, but, or, or not semiconductors, uh, superconductors. Next up, polymers. This is just a type. And polymers are molecules of high molecular mass made by sequentially bonding repeating units called monomers. And what those repeating chains are, they're usually just chains of carbon. So those monomers might be simple, uh, simple carbon bonds, such as like CH3. And if you can continually repeat bonding those monomers, you get polymers. So monomers one, polymers is many. And just the more bands you get, the higher your mass gets. Now, what are some common polymers? This slide, I do want you to kind of just understand a little bit. What are some common examples of polymers? You have polypropene, polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, which is PVC. Uh, you also have nylon. 
where's all this stuff used? It's used in films, packaging, kitchenware, pipe fittings, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So shatterproof glasses, CDs, uh, furnishing apparel, all that stuff is where you're going to find those common polymers. So polymers are made by coupling small bands of carbon, small molecules of carbon, repeatedly bonding them together, and you're going to get a polymer. So as we talked about, a lot of plastics are polymers, kitchen air or kitchen aids, kitchen aidware, all sorts of those examples are polymers. All right, we do not need to worry about this cross-linking. There's more stuff on ceramics, which doesn't matter. All right, one thing I want to touch on here is we have two more things to touch on biomaterials and nanoparticles just exposing you to the idea of these these really aren't on the AP test at all but just kind of exposing you to them biomaterials when you have a biomaterial that's something that's going to be put into the human body or maybe an animal and it has to have certain physical requirements and it has to have certain chemical requirements and the body is a very stringent to what you put in it so these materials cannot cause any inflammatory responses if they do, your body's going to reject it and it's going to attack it with antibodies, which that will be bad. So it needs to mimic real properties of the body. Right? It cannot contain even small amounts of hazardous impurities like lead and it cannot degrade in the body. It has to be able to sit in the body for a long time. So when we're talking about implants such as heart valves, or even uh, titanium rods into your legs, these are the things that have to go into uh, uh, the thinking uh, when you make a biomaterial. So there's what a heart valve looks like, a vascular graft, a skin graft, anything like that is a biomaterial. Last thing I just want to touch on, and I know we are cruising through this, and it probably works better if you didn't take notes on ch this chapter and just kind of listen as we go. The last thing I want us to talk about, ignoring the liquid crystal part here, is nanoparticles. What are nanoparticles? They're different sized particles of semiconductors. They can emit different wavelengths of light depending on the size of energy. So nanoparticles are defined as particles smaller than a billionth in size. They act differently when they're at that size than they do when they are together as a metal. And what we're finding out is that uh, these nanoparticles can be used in medicine and electronics and they have all different types of applications and they are different because their properties are different when they're in smaller quantities such as nanoparticles as they are combined as a metal as a whole. So I know we flew through that chapter really, really quick. None of it's really on the AP test. I really wanted to expose you to two things there. The energy gap bonds in the first couple of slides and understanding just what polymers are and where they used, are used in your daily life. Other than that, don't sweat anything else for Chapter 12.